And we are back on the Zero Hour. I am Richard R.J. Escow. And you know, a lot of people have been wondering, how is it that so many people seem to do quite well in the economics profession, even though their predictions about the world around them tend to go so wrong? This is not true of all economists, of course, but of many. Our next guest uh, will help us answer that question. Jeff Madrick is one of our Best known economics writers. He has written for and continues to write for such publications as The Nation and Harper's. He's also also the author of a number of books, the latest of which is Seven Bad Ideas, How Mainstream Economists Have Damaged America and the World. Jeff Madrick, thanks for joining us. Well, pleasure, RJ. Listen, I got to ask you, uh, I mean, this is kind of a wise guy question to kick off, but uh, was it tough to narrow it down to seven bad ideas? Well, in a way, yeah, they're kind of broad ideas. They encompass a lot of other notions, but I, my idea in doing it, my objective was to get the most important uh, issues out there to the public, reading public. Uh, so that's that's basically... I think I accomplished that, uh, reducing it to seven. Well, and let's start with the first one uh, in your book, Seven Bad Ideas, uh, which, by the way, I, I think is a great concept for a book. It's a, it's a great way to structure this conversation about the problems with economics. Um, and that is uh, the one you call the beautiful idea, uh, the invisible hand. It seems almost like the original sin of this this kind of economics, or the, all other errors, in a sense, flow from it. Uh, talk to us about where that came from and why it's wrong. Well, it came from Adam Smith and uh, the 1776 uh, classic book, The Wealth of Nations. Uh, it didn't entirely originate with Smith. Uh, there were other people talking in these terms uh, Basically, what it says was unfettered markets, markets without government interference, will reach a price for a good or a service that is ideal, that will satisfy the consumer's wants and the producer's needs, and um, uh, ex- and, uh, and and reach an equilibrium. Wealth, right, yeah. Expand wealth in the most efficient way possible. It reaches an equilibrium, which begins to uh, become a technical point. Uh, uh, An equilibrium is an idea where the supply and demand balance each other out. The real problem with the invisible hand is the claim is they balance each other out at an ideal price and uh, and a set of... um, uh, supply and demand, which leads to the maximum wealth for the nation and the greatest good for buyers and sellers. And to me, this is uh, just a preposterous idea when taken literally. It's an interesting idea because it allows one to claim that we should keep the government out of setting any prices and setting any quotas on goods and services. Um, It has some truth to it. Let me hasten to say, R.J., but the truth is exaggerated. Well, and and I I think it's a seductive idea also, besides having some utility for certain interest groups and so on. I I, I would venture to say it's a seductive idea, Jeff Madrick, because it... it, it, you know, it has it's aesthetically pleasing. It, it's kind of all encompassing. It's like a unified theory of the market. But one of the big problems with it, and you allude to this in your book, of course, but uh, it, it, to anyone who really gives it critical consideration, is that even its exponents will tell you it depends on everybody having a buyer and seller and so on having ad- full information or, or adequate information about the thing being uh, sold or purchased, and in the real world, that almost never happens, does it? Right. It never happens. It certainly doesn't happen on Wall Street. Uh, Let me point out that I'm the first one to say it's a beautiful and intoxicating idea. That's why it becomes pretty dangerous. That's not the only issue, though, that there's no information uh, available to all people. It it implies that all people know what they want and know the price they should be paying. Well, do we all really know what we want? Do we know know, uh, uh, how much 
we want to pay for something, whether it will make us happier, are we making rational decisions about buying one product and not another, are we making rational decisions about stocks and bonds? Hardly. Uh, but it's an interesting concept in the sense that it leads, this is the important issue, I think, RJ, it leads to the main proposition that markets correct themselves. If the price goes down, more people will want something. If the price goes up, fewer people will want something. If the price goes up, uh, business will be more willing to produce these products. If the price goes down, they'll produce less. And that's how we get to an equilibrium without government help. But the claims that it leads to a, basically a perfect world, perfect competition, you and I'm sure you're uh, you, your audience have heard of perfect competition, becomes extremely uh, uh, contentious. And yet there is little contention. Read a first-year textbook, and the, the, uh, the questions about the invisible hand are in the following chapters, and they are not delivered with any kind of punch, with any kind of, uh, uh, the kind of punch that the invisible hand itself is um, uh, delivered. And then uh, that gets us to, of course, not every good or service is uh, something that's a matter of choice for people. Some things are necessities. Some things are subject to monopoly and so on. And and that might be a way to transition to the second of your seven bad ideas, which is Say's Law and Austerity Economics. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about that, if you would. Well, an offshoot of the invisible hand is that if we save enough, that's all we need to do to maximize capital investment. Capital investment is critical to economic growth. Economic growth is the expansion of GDP and increase in, uh, in incomes for all. We all like that. The basic idea is save more, and Say's Law says interest rates will come down. Now I'm oversimplifying some, but interest rates will come down and business will therefore invest. It, too, is an outgrowth of a simple view of the invisible hand, and it is basically wrong. And In fact, John Maynard Keynes dedicated his major work to showing why it is wrong. If you save more, it may lead to reduced demand for goods and products, and therefore business won't invest. And that's by and large what happens in recessions and through slow economic recoveries, something like what we're getting now. So what we've seen, we're talking with Jeff Madrick, the author of Seven Bad Ideas, how mainstream economists have, uh, I don't have the full title with me, messed up America and the world. Um, damaged America. Damaged America, America excuse me. <laughs> uh, I crawled off my screen here. Um, so, uh, and when it comes to austerity economics in particular, we've seen once again, as we've seen at other periods in the past, including 1936 under FDR and so on, that when people try to apply this thinking in real world world situations, Greece, uh, uh, Europe in general, perfect example of this, uh, it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, in, in, and yet it has devoted adherence nonetheless. How do some of these ideas, just go, jumping out of sequence a little bit, Jeff Madrick, how do some of these ideas uh, continue to have such devoted followers when all the data seems to clearly indicate they're wrong? Well, number one, let, let me put the austerity economics in terms of says law. Austerity means government should spend less and therefore, that will increase the natural savings, and we will invest more. One way that uh, p- that economists can say uh, can promote this idea is they just get their own data wrong, or they get their own theories wrong. There's a, a widespread theory that austerity will promote economic growth. Um, it captured the fancy, uh, I think, of much of the world until a few years ago, when even the IMF devoted serious studies to show that just has not been true economically. But this idea that if we save more, we'll all be better off is also an appealing idea. It's an idea that I think all of us kind of like. It's an instinct we have. If we are careful and don't spend uh, too much, 
we will produce our wealth. Well, we will increase our wealth. Well, that may be true for a family, but it's not true for a broad economy that depends on uh, spending to uh, enable it to grow. So, uh, but and yet this idea continues to, despite the IMF and other people turning against it, continues to uh, grow and grow, and it's closely related. This, this notion to uh, your third bad idea, which is that um, governments limited social shows, excuse me, government, government's <laughs> limited social role and what you call Friedman's folly. Let's talk about that for a second. Where does that well, come from? We can we need uh, can do this just rather quickly. It's uh, it's the idea that government should stay out of it. Just keep government out of just about everything, and we'll all be okay. In economics, it has to do with the invisible hand. Don't let government uh, control prices. Don't let government set quotas on imports. Uh, uh, don't let government adopt tariffs to control prices on, in global markets. Don't adopt capital controls in, in uh, international markets. Let it all hang out, and more, the markets will take care of it and will efficiently lead to the, the greatest prosperity possible. Uh, that is basically, in my view, Friedman's fo folly. It was a notion we adopted for quite a while, beginning uh, in the 1980s. It exploded in some crises, well, before 2007, 2008, uh, in the uh, East Asian financial crises and the Mexican crisis before that and the Russian and Turkish crisis. Uh, then again uh, in 2007 and 2008 when we, we imported so much capital, especially from places like China, that it kept interest rates far too low and people borrowed too much uh, against credit that just wasn't any good. See, this is uh, for our listeners who, who, who may not make this connection. We're talking with Jeff Madrick, author of Seven Bad Ideas, How Mainstream Economists Have Damaged America and the World. This is very closely tied uh, intellectually and I think culturally, emotionally with R Reaganomics and the whole notion, as G Reagan said, that government isn't the solution to the problem. Government is the problem. It seems that at, at its core, while... Uh, my economist friends tell me that Milton Friedman did some good work at various points in his life. This aspect of his work and this aspect of how his work has been disseminated uh, and, and put into practice really seems to me more uh, based in emotion and uh, sociology and political science than it does in um, in uh, science, uh, or certainly the science of economics. Does that seem like a fair statement to you, Jeff? Well, I think he was a quite ideological guy. I think uh, the economics profession did not admit that for quite a while. It gr slowly accepted Milton Friedman's ideas beginning in the 1970s. People, uh, devoted Keynesians like Larry Summers, started to become Friedman followers in the sense that uh, the, what was important was keeping spending low, was keeping, inter, therefore, interest rates low and improving savings, and all would be fine uh, once we did that. So, yeah, this is all. Friedman was a very, uh, you know, some of your uh, audience would, I'm sure, be upset to hear this, uh, but Friedman was a very simplistic version of Adam Smith. He thought the free market worked all the time. Adam Smith didn't think that, in fact. He thought there should be controls on banking and quite a few other and quite a few other areas. So uh, uh, it's kind of interesting that we became so dogmatic and ideological by the 1980s and into the 1990s. And it's, inter it's fascinating because, to me, all of that history is the story of a seduction. It's the story of the seduction of a profession. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we won't have time to go into it in any detail. But I, it, to me, it's the story of the chairs that were endowed with that thinking in mind, the think tanks that were created. But also, I think, the intellectual appeal. And, uh, you know, it's fascinating. If I were... Uh, 
a graduate student now in anthropology, I think I would study the e- economics tribe as uh, as um, my target. But uh, some are, by the way. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it because I've been saying for years that it's 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 badly needed. So unfortunately, we're going to you know have to close it off. But your other ideas include low inflation is all that matters. There are no speculative bubbles. These are the bad ideas among the seven. It's astonishing that people would still believe that in our this day and age. Uh, low inflation is all that matters. That bad idea seems to be driving the Fed, Federal Reserve conversations now and globalization as Friedman's folly writ large. Any uh, closing thoughts? Right, your last and seventh thought, I would like to a closing comment, at least on the, the idea that economics is a science. Econo- it's, very, it's very hard to defend economics as a science. It is about people, and people are not... Uh, are not uh, chemicals, they're not minerals, they change their mind, they're very hard to predict. Science depends on predictability. And while I think economics can say very intelligent things about human behavior or what happens if humans behave a certain way, they can't really predict human behavior very well. And behavior is at the heart of economics. Well, I think that's very well put. I guess, you know, they used to call economics the dismal science, but with the, the, the colorful effect it's having on people's lives nowadays for good and ill, maybe we have to call it the lively non-science instead. But uh, we're going to unfortunately have to leave it there, but I encourage people to read the book. The book is Seven Bad Ideas, How Mainstream Economists Have Damaged America and the World. Jeff Madrick, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, thanks for having me.